Good evening, everybody. Welcome on into the chat. Welcome in. Welcome in, everybody. Hopefully, you guys are having a great weekend. They did Ohio State. Our Aries Ohio State did win. I was reading the comment as I was commenting on the comment. They did. It's been a good day. I'm not even wearing scarlet or gray, though. I'm wearing blue today. I'm wearing the opposite. But yeah, they did. They did win. We were watching it as we were painting earlier. So welcome on in, everybody. It's Saturday night. Saturday night. Has it, Was anybody bored today, like, during the day? I felt like coming live, but I was like, I don't know if anybody is live like, or if anybody's home on a Saturday afternoon. Like, I don't know if everybody goes out and does their shopping or if you guys are just kind of homebodies like me because I was bored today. I was like, is anybody going live? <laughs> so uh, that's how I was. Well, I'm from Ohio too. Jesus loves me. <laughs> Look at that. From Springfield. That's even closer. <laughs> that's really close to me, actually. That's awesome. I'm just reading the chat a little bit, but welcome on in. If you guys wouldn't mind just taking a second to hit the like button, it'll send it out into the algorithm. It brings people into the chat and it's free to do. It's free to do. Oh, hi, St. Jenny. Welcome in everybody. Hey, Jan. And thank you, Jan, for helping me with tonight's live. She really helped me out. I was like, I love that. I feel like I had a team like going on today. Like last night, Olivia was telling me stuff and then like about a video. And then today Jan was texting me and I was like, well, look at me with, with a team over here helping me out. I loved it. I felt, I felt, felt good. But Jan always texts me when there's documents or something's up. But I've been looking forward to this airmail article coming out that came out for Idaho 4. That's what we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, I've been waiting on it to come out for a while now. So I was glad that it finally came out. And I got to read um, through it right before the live. So if you would like to join our channel membership, we would love to have you. I'm going to slip it into the chat here. Um, if you guys, you'll see it throughout the live. So you can join any way you want to join. Um, if you're watching on a replay, just hashtag Titanium Built and your comment your thoughts below. Also, my name is Tanya or Titanium Built. You can call me either or if, it's just, if this is your first time here. It's nice to meet you. If you're a returning Titan, welcome on back. Steve, that sounds like me. I went to Dollar Tree though. <laughs> he said, I made a quick trip to Family Dollar, but otherwise home board all day. Yeah, that was me. Except for, I went to Dollar Tree to get, uh, I don't even, what did I get? Oh, bleach, but they didn't have it. So I went to Target. So I went to Target today, actually. And I got to wear my new Target outfit into the Target. It only took me two Targets to find this whole complete outfit. <laughs> you guys said you liked it. So that's why I got it when we were on vacation. Oh man, Aries. I, I thought I saw that on the news, something about that. You have been sleuthing around Jan. <laughs> hey, Ida, welcome in. So welcome on in guys. We'll go ahead and get started with the um, airmail article. So I figured we'll read through that first and then we'll um, go over to Nancy Grace's new video. She just came out with, she came out with this last night. Um, so she has a new video. The airmail articles, you don't have to have listened to like the first five to be able to pick up with number six. Um, but he, um, Howard Bloom is an author who has been putting together these airmail articles. And um, I don't know if you guys have heard of them before now or if you haven't. But if you want to listen to them um, and you don't want to pay for the article itself, I do have it on my playlist. Um, they're, they're, they should be titled airmail article one two, three, four, five. So if you want to go back and look at those, you can, it's under my Idaho playlist. And also I have a, the case against Brian Kohlberger and then the Idaho four playlist. So either one of those, it should have it under there. So let me put myself down here. Cause I'm going to try to make this as big as I can make it for all of us. That way, if you want to read along, um, it's easier on your screen to do so if I blow it up a little bit. So welcome on in everybody. Hey, Carrie. Hey, Diana. Hey, Stephanie. Mm. Just cleaning my... Uh, just have to clean my glasses. Okay. 
So this is, <clears throat> like I said, this is Howard Bloom. I'm going to try to read this the best that I can for you all, but we all know that Howard likes to make them long. And he also likes to put in words that nobody's heard of before. Like they're not just like long words. They're literally, I'm like, what does that even mean? I got to look up the definition. So if you need any of the definitions, just let me know. I have them. I know them now. I've looked them up. <laughs> There's Olivia. Welcome in. Hmm. <laughs> Where's JLR at? Where's, what's he doing? What's he up to? I just, see, I never, I don't follow him. I don't know why. He'd be a good one. He was yelling at someone the other day. I was going into court. I was like, look at him go. He loves to do that. That's his thing. <laughs> That's his thing. Um, so this is the eyes of the killer part um, six. After a few false leads, a grieving father turned amateur sleuth discovers the prosecution's hidden ace. That's Howard Bloom there. So he, yeah, just came out on the seventh. I don't even have my watch on, so I don't even know what time it is. Um, people say heals. Um, people say time heals all wounds. They tell you you'll get over it. I'm going to actually blow this up a little bit for us. I have it actually already blown up a little bit. Okay, we're going to blow it up to that. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. He does show up everywhere. <laughs> He's so funny. Um, I would never want to be in trouble with the law because I could just see, I could just hear him yelling. They're going to get you for this, Tanya. Like, <laughs> you know, that's what he usually says. Um, so here's the article. People say time heals all wounds. They tell you you'll get over it, but they never, they, but they've never buried their child. That stays with you. It works on you. It sinks in deep and never lets go. Solace, not a chance. But still you try, you discover anger, you vow vengeance, new theories are irresistible. They hold the promise of elixirs. You go all out, hot pursuit. But here's the rub. It doesn't help and you know it. It's not enough. In the armor you've erected, you keep from constantly screaming why, because why is beyond your reach, an equation that can't be solved. There will never be an answer that makes sense, yet the question will always command your thoughts. In the end, it's all that matters. And without this knowledge, without the exculpation of reason or faith or purpose that understanding can offer things will not hold together gravity has failed and you're forever falling it says kaylee gonzalez had solved the mystery all evening it had been gnawing at her the discon disconcerting image fixed in her mind actually it had, it had first grabbed her earlier that afternoon october 5th 2021 a surprisingly cool Tuesday in the pleasant university town of Moscow, Idaho, a day when the sudden drop in temperature was the first unwanted reminder that a glorious Indian summer was over and the Northwest winter would soon be closing in. After classes, Kaylee, who, had, who loved to shop with her boyfriend at the time, Jack DeCore, had headed to the Walmart Supercenter on Pullman Road, just a quick drive from the University of Idaho campus. The warehouse store was vast and ugly, um, situated atop across um, acres of black asphalt parking lanes, like a solid concrete fortress, but it sure had a lot of stuff. You could pretty much find anything. The two students had been wandering through the maze of harshly lit aisles when Kaylee's, when Kaylee first noticed the grandmotherly woman, she had pale stringy hair and the bewildered look of someone trapped in a situation she couldn't quite understand. But more unnerving was the animal straightness of the woman's stare. She fixed Kaylee with a gaze and, and held it way past anything that could be considered polite or for that matter, normal. True, it wasn't threatening, but it was decidingly odd. Only in retrospect would Kaylee decide it had been beseeching. I'm going to move the chat over here so it's a little easier to see you guys. And if you need to get my attention, just put some, some big in the chat, like some, um, I don't know. What was the jam that you did? You did like fireworks. <laughs> that worked out perfect. Okay, there, that way I can read the chat. Um, okay. Let me see here. So let's see. Where are we at? Then when Kaylee and Decor were at the checkout counter, she happened to look up absently, only to discover that the woman now standing at rigid attention with her back to a wall of shelves had once again homed in on her with the, um, with the same unremitting stare. It was creepy. What is up with her, Kaylee wondered. 
And now, hours later, she knew. She had just seen the face again, this time on a missing persons flyer. The woman Kaylee was convinced was Sharon Archer, a frail 62-year-old encumbered by diabetes and brain damage, who had abruptly vanished a week earlier from the house she shared with her husband up north in Coeur d'Alene. The couple's car at 2013 white Toyota Highlander was missing too. No one knew what happened, and in the absence of real information, increasingly feverish internet speculation flourished. The scenarios ran the gamut from a mental breakdown to more fanciful schemes involving abduction or murder. But now Kaylee knew, and at 1025 that night, just moments after all the pieces had clicked into place in her mind, Kaylee prompted telephone, promptly telephoned <clears throat> sorry, the Moscow Police Department. <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> I'm like losing my voice. She spoke to Sergeant Dustin Blaker, telling him she was convinced she spotted the woman, and then for good measure, she sent an email with the missing person noticed attached. I love this picture of her. She's so pretty. Despite the late hour, the sergeant, a barrel-chested weightlifter with just over a year on the force, consistent. I know I'm going to say this wrong, wrong words, this word wrong, so we're going to look it up. I don't know why I was going to say that wrong, but I was. Conscientiously went to work. Officers were dispatched to the Walmart parking lot, and they had combed through its darkness, its dark recess, oh, sorry, for the tail, tall tail uh, Toyota. That's like a tongue twister. Tall tail Toyota. At the same time, calls were made to local hotels asking if a woman matching Sharon Archer's description had checked in. Both searches were fruitful. And assessing the Walmart surveillance camera video proved to be nettlesome. It had to be postponed until the next day and then, too, turned out to be another dead end. As it happened, it wasn't Kaylee's call that solved the mystery. More than two anxious weeks passed before an angler perched on a dock noticed a bulky shape entombed in the lead gray depths of um, Furman Lake, a popular fishing spot about a 10-minute drive from downtown Coeur d'Alene. When police lifted a white Toyota Highlander from the water, a body lay inside. The autopsy identified the corpse as Sharon Archer, and while the specific circumstances of her grim death remain conjectured, no foul play has been charged. The investigation into the case petered out soon to be overtaken by fresh tragedies. So that was the, that was the, you know, we've heard about the case of, you know, Kaylee, um, like she thought she had seen somebody like she thought she, we, I thought I had heard that she did help find the person in that case, but I guess they, she didn't help find the person, um, necessarily, but she did call cause she thought she saw her. So, um, only now in December 2022, a little more than a previously unimaginable year later, the Sharon Archer case and the minor role his daughter played in the hunt suddenly reared up in Steve Gonzalez's newly agitated mind as if summoned signposted as he searched for the means to make his way through the battering pain of his own be bereavement. For Steve and his wife and the remaining four children have been brought low. And it says here, airmail reached out to Steve for comment, but Steve's attorney said neither he nor his client can comment due to a gag order. So just keep that in mind. Um, less than a month earlier, in the dreary pre-dawn darkness of November 13th, 2022, Kaylee, her best friend, Maddie Mogan, who might as well have been another daughter to him and his wife, and two other University of Idaho students, Santa Cronodal and her boyfriend, Ethan Chapin, were gruesomely stabbed to death in a house a stone's throw away from the heart of the campus. The unknown killer, or was it killers, he wondered, was still at large. It was an inconsolable loss and an unfathomable crime. Steve struggled to make sense of his emotions in the aftermath of his daughter's murder. His incoherent anger ro um, roiled, raw, and unfeathered. One day he ro um, railed with, a, with an uncomprehending anguish <clears throat> um, at the cosmic injustice of it all. You can't imagine sending your girl to college and they come back in an urn. He grieved openly to a group of reporters. You're numb. You can't absorb that amount of pain and agony. Next, he chose to target the, um, let's read, I don't know this word, guys. So we're going to look it up. Capricious. Capricious. Capricious, if not lackadaisical manner with which he had decided law enforcement was attempting to solve the murders. I do not feel confident. He responded with a vehement candor then asked on a news show about the police investigation. And that's why I push the envelope and say a little bit more. Yet even as he made himself available to nearly every journalist who reached out to him, Steve couldn't help feeling he'd confided to a friend that all his 
felt or heartfelt proclamations, everything he had been calling necessary truths added to, up to added up to little more than a sort of feeling indulgence, self-indulgence. Sorry. Um, I'm going to read that again. I'm just going to start that whole paragraph over because that just was bad. Yet, even as he made himself available to nearly every journalist who reached out to him, Steve couldn't help feeling he confided to a friend that all his heartfelt proclamations, everything he had been calling necessary truths, added up to little more than a sort of self-indulgence. His public sharing of his anguish and misgivings gave him little comfort. I hate to be that guy, he would say. Even more disheartening after all of his years as a father, all devoting himself full time to doing what he thought best for his children, he was confronted with the devastating reality that there was nothing more he could do for Kaylee, nor could he identify a clear headed strategy to lead his grieving family forward. Never had he been so unprepared and yet never had his family needed so much. His grieving family needed him like never before, but he couldn't figure out how to lead them forward. He was at a loss. And that's when it hit him with a jolt. For no apparent reason at all, he suddenly found himself recalling the frantic, um, frenetic speculation surrounding Sharon Archer's disappearance and how his daughter had unhesitantly unhes thrown herself into the investigation. And with her actual participation, now a detective, a barrel had in effect been crossed. What had previously been a diversion had become real. It dawned on him, too, that he, too, had been transformed into a character in an even more poignant and notorious true crime story, a perplexing mystery that had captured the nation's attention. For weeks, he had been struggling on, no dogma, no emotion. It was as if he had been letting himself be tossed around by the surging waves of breaking news, but now he knew what he had to do. He would do it because for a father, no sacrifice is too great. A father's duty to his child never ends, not even with her death. He would do it because while he was a man alone with his family support and assistance, they became a force whose commitment and focus was greater than any the so-called authorities could muster. He would do it because to walk any other path would be weakness or even cowardice. And he would do it because it was what his beloved KK would do and had tried to do. He would solve the case. And as Steve's investigation rumbled forward, it was just a brief matter of time, a week or two at most, before his quest became instrument. Instru I can't even say that word. We're going to just look it up. We're going to try to talk it out. You know, you just can't speak words. That's what I can't do. His quest became inextricably intertwined with another amateur's own deep dive into the events of the fateful November night in Moscow. And perhaps this alliance had been preordained too. For just as fathers are often drawn to follow in their daughter's footsteps, so do daughters on occasion take, an emulating, um, take to emulating their dads. Let me grab my drink really quick. Smoke. Oh, Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate you guys all listening to me read this. Um, I really appreciate it. Sorry, I can't really see the chat too much, but I hopefully you guys are all being good. <laughs> and if you guys don't mind just hitting the like button, it really helps the channel and it's free to do. I really appreciate you guys. And if you want to subscribe, we'd love to have you. We would love to have you subscribe. Um, I think it's I want Vitaly. I want to make sure I'm saying her last name right. Okay. So here in this part, they're going to start talking about a, a YouTube creator. So when I'm referring to Olivia in this next section, I'm not referring to Kaylee's sister, Olivia. I just want to let you guys know that because I thought at first he spelled her name wrong. And then I was like, I got confused for a minute. So I want to let you guys know that. Um, but yet, as Olivia Vitale tells it, she had never paid much attention to how her father earned his living. The fact that he had been a hard charging crime reporter in his native Chicago Olivia explained to me and then had gone on to a career as both a reporter and editor in Los Angeles had not made much of an impression on her when she was growing up in Washington state. Her parents had divorced and his occupation in a distant city was an irrelevancy amid the bustle of her own life. Or so she had thought, but now she was beginning to suspect to suspect that perhaps biology was indeed destiny. 
For back then, a precocious 22-year-old working in real estate in Florida, Vitaly had been inexplicably drawn to a flurry of media accounts recounting the brutal murder of Gabby Petito by her fiancé as the free-willing young couple had vanned across the country. Uh, not constrained by any formal journalistic training or experience, she posted personal, empathetic, yet carefully researched videos about the case on TikTok and YouTube, and she didn't stop posting when the, this mysterious mystery was put to rest and had vanished from the front pages. Crime, unfortunately, is a growth industry, and Olivia shrewdly hitched a ride on the comet tail of the Zooming business. Inventive and persistent, Vitaly chased one confounding case after another, and within a year or so, the Chronicles of Olivia were pulling in tens of millions of viewers. By the time she was 25, Vitaly was one of the go-to sources for a generation who got their crime stories down and dirty, down dirty and dishy from the internet. And one of her avid followers had been Kaylee. Well, thank you so much, Jan. That's so nice. Thank you. The 80s kid. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I feel the same though. He likes the big words. He really, this guy, he, he, this guy loves the big words. And I'll have, and I'll have someone in the comments. They'll, someone in the comments will be like, you just were terrible at reading that. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry. I'm trying over here. Huh. Um, Steve had discovered this connection when he and his oldest daughter, Olivia. So now we're talking about Olivia because her, she spells her name A L I V E A. If you're just wondering. Um, we're all just saying, audaciously checking out Kaylee's phone for clues ever since she had decided to sweep all the ex extraneous emotional debris cluttering his mind aside and instead to live by his wits he'd been on the hunt the two of them had gone through the list of contacts reached out to Kaylee's friends and helped to reconstruct the last hours of Kaylee and her best friend Maddie's information they shared with authorities they had been they had also discovered a persistent series of phone calls in the wee hours of that morning from Kaylee to her ex-boyfriend, Jack Decor, calls that had gone unanswered, star-crossed young romance, or could it be something more ominous? Steve quickly passed that intelligence to on to the cops. So apparently it was Steve that was telling the cops that they called. Yet when the Moscow PD similarly hooked Jack up to a lie detector and administered a DNA swab to compare with evidence found at the crime scene, he passed both examinations with flying colors, according to one of Steve's friends. Steve, however, was still not completely, I'm going to say persuade because I don't know the word. Nothing about the murders made any sense, and so everything seemed possible. And so when a grieving Jack came to the Gonzalez home not long after the events to pay his respects, Steve gravely demanded that the young man submit to an indignity to the indignity of a physical inspection. Jack promptly rolled up his sleeves, lifted his shirt, exposed his neck and displayed his hands, both palms up and down while Steve meticulously searched in vain for a telltale search or scratch or bruise. But Steve was not done caught up in his newfound forensic professionalism I didn't know about this part. I don't remember hearing about this part on the Chronicles of Olivia um, interview. He took a series of photographs documenting Jack's unblemished state. It was exculpatory evidence that would come in handy, he felt, as the authorities proceeded to compile their list of suspects. And with that bit of awkward business out of the way, the two grieving men finally embraced. In the days that followed, Steve tracked down Hunter Johnson, Chapin's frat brother and best friend, just before noon on November 13th, Johnson had been summoned by the two distraught survivors at the King Road house, where he had discovered Ethan's body. Days later, he gave his eyewitness account to Steve as a soldier might, straightforward, factual, and without either embellishment or emotion. It was only when he finished that the two men, both overwhelmed at, loss, at last, convulsed into tears. So apparently Hunter Johnson told them what he told the Gonzalez is what he found. And then they both were crying about it. I mean, I could not, I can't even imagine that. I can't even imagine going through that. Like, I mean, think about when you were 20, like think about where your brain and your head was and like where you were as a person, like me personally, I wasn't, I wasn't near grown. Still not going to be 38 in a couple weeks. So. Well, thank you. Be happy for gifting out five memberships. Thank you. Jan gifted five. Be happy gifted five. We're going to have all kinds of members. I love that. Thank you guys so much. 
and that's thanks for supporting the channel. I appreciate it. Um, so I guess, you know, that's about, that's, we know about Hunter Johnson now. So, um, Steve also made a point of knocking on the doors of the house adjacent to the murder scene and interrogating the neighbors. He was going where he thought he had to go, but his mission had not uh, produced the desired result. Over a month had passed and there had been no arrest, only vague statements about a missing Hyundai Elantra that had been spotted near the King Road house the night of the murders. The authorities had yet to name a suspect. It was infuriating. The prospect of his daughter's murder becoming one more cold case was torture. But as much as he needed to see a perp being led off in handcuffs, he also was was or sorry, he was also chasing after something else. He needed to know why. Why these kids? Why this house? Why had this nightmare enveloped his family's life? Okay, I was just making sure my camera was on um, so you guys could see me. Where are we at? Um, for his own peace of mind, he required a motive, and without this knowledge, nothing in his life from November 13 onward would ever make sense. It was, he'd explain, those current, uh, currents of frustration and perplexity that pushed him nearly six weeks after the murders to double down on his detective's mission. He decided he was done with working quietly on the sidelines. He made up his mind to go public to proclaim his new ambitious vocation and to ask for help. He would make a public appeal because Steve was certain that even if the police had failed to locate them, there had to be people out there who knew more about the sharing about, um, or sorry, knew more than they were sharing people, particularly students with some dodgy annex to hide might be more willing to whisper secrets to a mourning father than to a judgmental police than to the judgmental police. And with his plan set in mind and an affirming knowledge to Kaylee's memory, Steve reached out to Olivia Vitale. Olivia thought it was a hoax, one more internet fabrication. She did not believe that Kaylee's father had actually contacted her, and so she didn't respond. But it kept nagging at her. Was it possible that the email had been sent by Steve Gonzalez? And if so, could it be she be on the verge of a scoop? And so with a dil so with diligence, she belied her 25 years. She tracked down Olivia, who confirmed that in fact her father's email, that was her father's email address. Excitingly, Olivia wrote back. It was pragmatically brief courtship. Both would profit from the Gonzalez's appearance on Chronicles of Olivia. And more serpentipently, Olivia was already in Moscow. It'd be just 90 minutes straight up I-95 north to the Gonzalez home. The meeting was quickly arranged. And I don't know why they're calling her producer Bullhorn Betty, but that's what they did in this article. And I just think that's kind of funny because it's not. Vitaly was filled with trepidation as she and her producer, Bullhorn Betty, set up inside the family's yellowish living room with the interview for the interview with Steve, Olivia, and Christy, Kaylee's mother. Without any network impromptu, Vitaly had landed the sort of scoop that a generation earlier would have gone to Barbara Walters. But the Idaho murders was a new story owned by a new breed of journalist, an event sustained by the nonstop fulsome attention it received on the internet. And that was the interview. Um, if you guys didn't see that, you can go to Chronicles Olivia or I have them all under a playlist. Under the playlist, I have all of the um, Kaylee's family's interviews chronologically like put into, um, I think we did two lives for Kaylee because there were so many interviews. But then we did one for Ethan. We did one for Zana. We did one for Maddie. We did one for each person. Um, it has them all in there so that you guys can kind of see um, just like what they're saying and, you know, how they how they proceed things and, you know, stuff like that. So, Hey, Bridget, welcome in. I just happened to look down the perfect timing. Hey, Mount Mama, how, hey, how are you guys? How is everybody? I looked down for a second. Uh-oh, I better look back up or I'll stop reading. <laughs> the Gonzalez is shoulder to shoulder on the couch in their living room. Vitaly, who sits off camera, is a polite disembodied voice asking the questions, but there's a hesitancy to her probing. It is as if she's acknowledging... <clears throat> sorry, that she's intruding, that she doesn't belong in the house of grief. And her reaction is understandable. Steve's face is grave, solemn and expressionless, as blank and flat as an empty piece of paper. Watching the tape of the interview, one can feel the harsh tension in the room. Will the Gonzalez reconsider and order Vitaly and her producer to turn off the camera? It seemed very possible, even likely. And then something remarkable happens. The Gonzalez seemed to surrender, perhaps accepting the absurdity 
of the situation of their sitting in the in their living room talking to a stranger young enough to be one of their children about their innermost feelings with a video camera aimed at them like a weapon. That's kind of a bad way to put things. A restraining wall comes tumbling down, and like all mourners, they begin to talk about the past, the heartfelt memories of Kaylee poured out. Yet Steve has not forgotten his agenda, and he is soon back in the present. He wants to let the com um, complacent authorities know that they can what they can expect from him. He wants them to understand that if he can't get the job done, if they can't get the job done, he will. Staring into the camera, he proclaims with an earnest passion, we are not going to bed and wait for other people to solve a family problem. This is a family problem. And he continues to drive home the point that he's on the case. We're not going to sit here and let someone else do a job that we can add value to. He's determined, as he puts it, to make an impact, to listen to what people are saying, to be a part of solving it. He needs to feel, he volunteers with an affecting candor that I gave it my all, I did everything that I could. That's so sad. That's just a, that's a dad. I mean, and a mom would do that, but you know what I mean? Like that's just a father and a child. <clears throat> um, I swear I've been losing my voice since I went to the dentist. Um, but I haven't lost it yet. Yet he also acknowledges his limitations. He opens appeals for help in his, his hunt to find the killers. This takes a whole community. It takes all of us to solve. This is on us, Steve says, staring into the camera that has now become his ally, focusing directly on his audience. Are we going to let these people exist? And then as if the entire hour-long interview was built up to an uttering a single tent Ter oh, sorry, single terse yet unflinching pronouncement. And with his face as somber as the graveside mourners, he states, I'm telling you right now, we're coming for you. It's as much of a warning to the killer as it is in a um, in loose. We're going to look at him. In a locktable. Vow to himself. In a locktable. In ineluctable. Someone tell me that they've heard that word before because I haven't in my whole life. 38 years I've been on this earth. What does that say again? I'm sorry, guys. I ineluctable. Does anyone know what it means? I'm gonna, I want to look it up. Bet you can't even look it up. What does it mean? Okay, it means to avoid. Oh, wait, no, un unable to resist or avoid. Okay, well, I didn't know what that word meant, so... If y'all did, you get, you know, you get a little bingo slip today, like a little bingo chip. Um, however, two days after the interview was posted online, a 28-year-old graduate student in criminal justice at Washington State University was arrested as SWAT team of state troopers stormed into his parents' home across the country in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. Brian Kohlberg was swiftly extradited back to Idaho and charged with the murders of the four students. Steve's hunt was over before it had truly begun. He could at last hope to find a measure of peace. Oh, hey, Miss Linda. Oh, you're like, I think that you are like the, the oldest member I have and not, I don't mean age wise, Miss Linda, but I think you are 10 months. Oh my gosh. I love that. I love that. And maybe like there might be a couple, but I think that you might be. Oh man, we've been you've been we've been you've been here since Idaho, then since ten months because it'll be next month it'll be like yeah it'll be a, a year. Wow, that's next month. Holy cannoli, this year's gone by, guys. Um, this year has really gone by. My birthday is this month. I just I I should know that it's my birthday this month. I should know month we're in, but just seems like it goes by so fast. The doleful one year anniversary of the murders is looming and the parents of the victims, if their public utterances accurately reflect the spiritual accommodations they forged have managed to find ways of existing with the memories. For Jeffrey, Cur for Jeffrey Cornado, Zana's father, the process ha what had involved a sort of benign surrender. This happened, you know, what do you do? He said on CBS show before answering his own question. You can't do a damn thing. Stacy and Jim Chapin, Ethan's mother and father, have meanwhile sought solace, solace by setting up a foundation, Ethan's Smile, that will award scholarships to honor their son's memory. The charity is funded largely by the sale of bright designer mix of tulip bulbs, sweatshirts decorated with flowers, and fresh cut tulip bouquets. The Chapins live in Washington State, Skagit um, Valley, the flowering heart of the nation's tulip industry. 
but Steve Gonzalez has found neither res um, resignation nor acceptance. The arrest of a suspect, in fact, has brought not a sense of, fi of finality, but only broadening resent um, resentments and further nagging questions. For one thing, he remains determined to make sure the authorities have arrested the right man. And while he has grown increasingly convinced that Kohlberger was involved in the crime, Steve remains open to the possibility that others might also have been involved according to texts provided to airmail. Now, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what you say about that. I don't know what to say. About, I don't, I, when I read that, I don't know. It's either it's this dude or it's this dude and some other dudes, but we can't just arrest this dude if it's not just this dude. We need to get them all. Like, I don't, I'm, I don't know. I, I didn't like reading that today. I was like, I don't feel like we're sure now. Like, and I'm, I don't, I don't want to be questioning anything. It, seem, it seems to him quite possible that there are more perpetrators, that there were more perpetrators in the house on King Road on the night his daughter and her friends were killed. And if they were, they must still be at large. I'm going to grab my drink. Oh, I really wanted to order the tulips, but I had no place to put the tulips. I mean, they, I don't have a yard. <laughs> I felt so bad. I wanted to get the tulips. And I think I asked Vincent if we could send them to his mom, but I think, I don't know why we didn't do that. I forget why. Something about the weather out there. Okay. And thank you guys again for being here tonight. I appreciate you guys so much. Um, let me know what you guys are thinking of this ML article because like, it's that, that part really got me. Um, there's Brian when he first got arrested. There's Mc, McSteamy cop. <laughs> that guy was so adorable. I thought we all thought he was. Um, no, none of us was looking at Brian Goberger in that picture. He is furious that Kohlberger's trial, which had been scheduled to start on no, October 2nd, has been postponed indefinitely. He fears he complained that the trial won't occur for many months or even years. And he's particularly incensed by the no nonsense gag order that severely limits what the law enforcement authorities, the lawyers, and the families of the victims can publicly say about the case. It is not just that he deems this viola a violation of his fundamental constitutional rights, rather the hypocrisy of a specific specific intelligence has created a vacuum that's being filled by rumors, half truths and crock pot, crack pot lies. And once these malignant seeds are planted, they grow tall and wild on the internet. Steve needs answers, not rumors. And so despite the arrest of a suspect, he has not abandoned his quest. And it's not simply vanity. The belief that one middle-aged guy with only a background in it can get to the bottom of things. It's fear that propels him. The fear that if he waits passively for the cops finally to share what little they have managed to uncover, it might be too late. The remaining unidentified perpetrators will have gone to ground and justice will not be secured, nor will he ever get the terrible satisfaction of knowing the whole story. He will never achieve the state of grace that comes he wants to believe with understanding a motive. He will never know the answer to the question of the beating heart of the case. Why? We may never get that answer. I hope we do, but I, we might never. Um, and so for the past year, he has plowed on. It has not been easygoing so, or always fruitful. For one cool example, early on, an enticing tip came his way according to the text from a source he described as a jailhouse snitch. It was a tale that offered a tie up all the loose ends of the case and spurred on about or spurned on that promise both Steve and the private detective he had been um, hired, fanned out their inquiries into several states, oh, sorry, energized by the intoxicating possibility that he was on the verge of ac accomplishing what the professionals had failed to do. But in the bitter end, it was nothing more than an elaborate con, a malicious scheme to squeeze some money out of a grieving family's misery. The experience was demoralizing. I didn't even know about that. Yet Steve persevered only to be conned again, a grain, grainy, light bulb cam video of the King road neighborhood came his way that proved Koberger wasn't the lone killer. It was only after he went to some expensive or sorry, went to some expense and hired a professional videographer to examine the recording that he con conceded it was a fake. Okay. 
<laughs> then there was a decision to leak a video or a timestamp video of another vehicle tearing away from a street adjacent to the murder house just before dawn on the murder on the morning of the murders to one of the true crime internet sites. I'm going to read that again. Then there was his decision to leak a timestamped video of another vehicle tearing away from a street adjacent to the murder house just before dawn on the morning, morning of the murders to one of the true crime internet sites. His logic was that it was very possibly game-changing evidence. It needed official scrutiny. But this video, too, was also deemed a fake. And in the end, his tangible um, role... I don't know. That's not... Okay, so, tangential, tangential, tangential role and its dismission became a bit of an embarrassment. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we didn't spend time on this channel watching no uh, 15 hours of no Linda Lane footage, did we? Nope, we didn't. We sure didn't because we sure just wouldn't do that. I'd rather watch paint dry anytime, any day of the week. Sam, <laughs> man. Steve came to two unwavering conclusions. One, the internet theory suggesting that a drug ring had been involved in the killings were ludicrous. No pro is going to rough up someone not knowing who all is in the house. He texts a friend. There were, he pointed out, usually only three girls in the King Road house. His daughter, who had completed all of her coursework and would graduate in January, had just come down to Moscow for the weekend on a whim to show Maddie her new Range Rover. Explain to me how a hitman missed Ethan and Kaylee's new car. A professional would have been daunted by the presence of two additional people in the house that night. I'm grab my drink really quick. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Catherine, she said, just wait. I saw this on JLR. It gets better. <laughs> Anna, I don't think he, I don't think he's, yeah. <laughs> Tangents, thanks. <laughs> we'll get there, won't we? Okay. Um, and as for the rumors of a drug deal gone bad being an underlying motive, Steve had been told by the authorities that the tox toxicity reports on all four of the victims established that they, are, were, they had no drugs in their systems. Okay, so apparently no drugs were in their systems. I know we're still going to hear that, though, but I'm going to read this again. At, and as for the rumors of a drug deal gone bad being the underlying motive, Steve had been told by the authorities that the toxicology reports on all four of the victims established that they had no drugs in their systems. Besides that they wanted to score some pot, there was no need to get involved with the street dealer. The kids he pointed out could go down a street and in eight miles there, were, there was a store where they could easily make a buy despite the fact that marijuana remained illegal in Idaho. Christy, his wife, went with them went with them once to check it out. He texted the friend. So I guess there's a place you can get it. Two, there are some crazy-ass people who are really crazy, who are trying to elbow their way into the case with deliberate misinformation. Scream it to the people in the back. But not all of Steve's investigative efforts have been in vain. He had assembled a... Oh, man, I hate these stupid words of blue chip sources that he revealed to several friends, <clears throat> including an FBI agent in the St. Louis office who had shared his personal email so that his bosses in the bureau didn't learn that he was communicating with Steve. A handful of additional sympathetic law enforcement officers and most helpful of all, a conduit of to two of the grand jurors who had been on the panel that had voted to indict Brian Kohlberger. And in the process, he had compiled some startling revelations, hard-won information that he triumphantly disclo disclosed to his newfound internet associates. Okay, so this is what Steve's saying. Or he got this from the FBI people, I guess. Kohlberger had purchased a dark blue Dickies long-sleeve work uniform at the Walmart in Pullman, Washington. Not long before the murders, Steve had learned. Now, your girl, 
we've been saying that on this channel over here. I know you guys have been saying in the chat too. We looked it up. We said we thought there was a receipt for Walmart. And we, we, we laughed about it because why do criminals go to Walmart? They have the best cameras, but they also have the best deals. So the authorities had a copy of the $49.99 receipt. And they also now had a theory to explain how Kohlberger had managed to escape from the crime scene without a scratch and without leaving an incriminating drop of blood in his getaway car or his apartment. He had worn the work uniform during the murders and then had disrobed before he got behind the wheel of his Honda Elantra for his circuit drive back to the to his apartment. Perhaps the authorities hypothesized he had stuffed the work suit into a plastic garbage bag and then shoved it into his trunk. Only there was no sign of the Dickies outfit. The police had looked high and low, but they couldn't find it, just as they couldn't locate the murder weapon. They had a receipt for a K-bar knife he had purchased online months before the killings, but this too had seemingly vanished. And as long as the two, these two crucial pieces of evidence remain unavailable, Steve feared the case against Kohlberger would remain more open than shut. Even more troubling if true, was what Steve had learned from people who had spoken to members of the grand jury who had been presented or pre, uh, who had been pre, present or pre, presented with the pro, uh, with the prosecution's case. It centered on the alleged behavior of the two roommates who had miraculously survived the night unscathed. How he wondered could they have slept blissfully unaware through the savage pre-dawn stabbing murders of four people in a narrow house with paper thin walls. Later, a police affidavit revealed that one of the survivors, Dylan Mortensen, had in fact heard noises and left her room only to spot a masked, darkly clad intruder making his way through the residence before she retreated to her room and did not summon help for another eight hours for reasons that have never been revealed. Yet Steve had been told that the two survi sur <clears throat> survivors allegedly had not only been awake while the killings had taken place, but they had, been, they had heard everything. More astonishingly, his grand jury sources allege that the two girls had been texting one another as the murderer methodically went from room to room to the, or went from, sorry, went from one room to the next. So Steve's been told they were awake, texted back and forth. So crazy. But we did say those dig we did say those dicky coveralls. I said he's he wore probably some dicky coveralls, and that's why he didn't have his knife and his knife sheath in a belt a loop. There's no belt, there's no loop on there to put it in. There's no belt loop. So you just unless you're gonna hold your belt with no loop, it's just gonna hold on your hips. You're just gonna hold the sheath in your hand. And it's so big. I, I've held one. They're so like the clasp and everything, it's huge. The sheath itself is huge. The knife is huge, but the sheath is huge. I, I wasn't really impressed with the knife that much. I'm not going to lie. Not like, I mean, you know, like it wasn't really heavy. It wasn't, it just seemed like a, like a regular chef's knife. If you were like, I mean, it was a lot sharper, you know, of course, but if you were to hold one, that's the same like heaviness that I got from it. <clears throat> I didn't feel like it was any heavier or, you know what I mean? Like a lot of people said it was really heavy and like all this, and I didn't get that. So, um, it says the possibility that two people had a sense of the horror while it occurred and not had and not and had not acted, calling neither friends nor 911, left Steve floored. And no less confounding they had in his sources were acknowledgeable as he believed than let hour after hour after hour tick away before they finally decided to summon friends. It added an entirely new uh, entirely new band of mystery to a crime that was already bound by unanswered um, unanswered questions. And so Steve intensified his efforts to get answers and that dodged process. He came to believe that the government must have a protected source and informant who could provide testimony that would tighten the screws that held together the case against Kohlberger. Steve was determined to walk, to talk to them. He did not want to wait for the trial to, to get the, um, the knowledge he needed for his peace of mind. He needed relief now. And after some digging, he grew convinced he had the informant in his sights. He was preparing to reach out to this individual to get right in his face and, and confront him. He would explain that he was empowered by a father's natural right to understand fully the last moments of his daughter's life. In fact, it was his duty. 
It was an argument he felt that no one could reject. And at last he would know the story of what really had happened to Kaylee and why. But before he could make his move, before he could get in the room, he have he would have to have a heart to heart talk with the witness. He was unexpectedly stopped in his tracks by the FBI. The Bureau had sent an official letter to Steve's attorney in Moscow, Shannon Gray, warning that if there was any attempt to conduct the individual Steve had been pursuing, there would be legal consequences. The witness had originally reached out to the authorities through a tip line that promised to protect the identities of anyone volunteering information, and the Bureau was duty-bound to honor that commitment. And the letter went to, the, went to make clear with an intimidating force the fact that Steve was the father of one of the victims gave him no dispension from the legal consequences that accompanies tampering with a government witness. Huh. I don't know how to say those words. We're just going to look it up. Stymie. Stymie to Steve skulked away. The promise of real understanding was out there, yet still tantalizing beyond his grasp. And with this setback, he fell into a period of stasis. Racked by his frustration and despair, all he could do was send a disordered text to one of his fellow internet detectives. There is so much more to this story than is on, than is in the media. Memories live in the past. Dreams, however, are part of an idealized version of what the world might become. In dreams, the poet, the poet noted, begin responsibilities, they hold the future. And so thwarted and his sleuthing, still staring with bitterness at hard mysteries he cannot crack, Steve had expanded his focus. If he cannot conduct the investigation provoked by his memories of his daughter, he will at least ensure that at some distant appointed time, there will be a measure of justice. Before on the Gonzalez family Facebook page, he and his wife and his daughter, Olivia, along with their other relatives, appear in hoodies displaying a steely message. Justice for Kaylee, House of Bill 186, shots fired. The Idaho State Legislative Legislator Bill 186 passed last spring affirmed that if the chemicals required for an intravenous execution were unavailable, a death sentence could be fulfilled by a firing squad. <clears throat> Just want to let everyone know, too, like it, Brian Koberger ain't getting sent to the firing squad today, tomorrow, next year, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Like there's a guy that's been on their death row for like 40 years now. Like he's still just sitting comfortably hanging out. So you know, when people are like, they're like, there's, he said, they're sending him to the firing squad. They're not really, sent, they're not sending him anywhere right now. So um, just want to let everyone know. <laughs> it is an unforgiving promise Steve is making yet. Yeah, can I, I father to Calvary um, criticize the wild dimensions, his bereavement encompasses. Who am I to challenge the intensity of his grief? True. How can I dare to point out the terrible irony in avenging murder with murder? In the end, all I can do is acknowledge it with a strange, frightening tale was set in motion on that night in Moscow last November and that Steve has become another victim and that his future, oh, sorry, and that his future is now hate. And that his future is now hate. I don't think that his future is now hate. That's a little, now that's a little, saying a little much. I'm going to make drink, guys. Oh, Cheryl, I'd probably fall out of my chair and have a heart attack. <laughs> when that happened. So I wonder who the witness could have been that they were like, they're talking about, they said state's witness, Steve knew who it was. He wanted to talk to him, but he did say all of the videos that came out were phony, phony, fake, fake, phony, phony, fake. So <laughs> kind of makes me happy because, you know, um, people were watching those videos for hours upon hours upon hours upon hours upon hours. And your girl just can't, I can't do that. Unless I'm looking for something, unless I know it's there, I, I can't, you know, I'm just like, I think it's probably because I'm blind too. And one eye, and like, if I can't see something then I like, get upset because I'm like, I want to see it too. So, um, if you guys want to read this article though, I, maybe I could put it, I don't know if I can put it in the chat, if it'll, it might let you go around the paywall. So I'll try. Um, and if it doesn't, then. You can always sign up with your email. Um, just remember to um, unsubscribe because I forgot to do that. Hmm. You would think with the, you would think that I don't know. I I wonder when he realized he forgot his sheath. 
I think that he didn't realize it until he was um, going back up. The, I think that's what he was doing. He was going back up the stairs to get it when he saw Dylan. And then he decided not to go get the knife and he exited either the front door or the back door. I don't know. I'm still, I'm still stuck on the front door. Really? Sweet Sleuthy? I didn't know that. We're our buddies. Is it your dominant eye? Mine's my dominant. I, mine's my right eye. That sucks. Okay. I'm going to move it over to Nancy. Let her take the wheel. Because, <laughs> you know, only like she can. Um, so I had a couple of questions. Like I was listening to this and I was like, Does that makes sense. Does that make sense? So um, I'll probably pause it here and there just, you know, just for a few seconds. You know, I usually let it play throughout for you guys. Um, but if you guys wouldn't mind just taking a second to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. That's all free to do. And it's really cool to do that. And I'll try not to interrupt the, um, the, the video too much. So I'm going to go ahead and play it. Also, if you haven't checked out any of um, the other like Brian Kohlberger documentaries that have come out, I have them all on my playlist. Um, the one that Nancy Grace did, she did a documentary. Fox Nation's done documentaries. We have all the documentaries and we have really old ones too. In the last hours, we are learning more and more about the Brian Koberger prosecution. As all of you legal eagles know now, Koberger will face trial in the murders of four beautiful University of Idaho students. I had the opportunity to meet alone with the mom of Ethan Chapin. Her resiliency is amazing after what all she and the other victims' families have been through. And on the footsteps of that meeting that I will never forget at CrimeCon, we are learning more and more about the crime scene. And I only wonder if all the parents are privy to very, very disturbing information that we are learning. For instance, allegations that one of the victims was essentially trapped and couldn't get away. That many believe Maddie, Madison Mogan, was the intended victim. Why? This, as the court is actually considering a closed courtroom for various hearings where no one can be present, which is contrary to everything that the justice system stands for, open courtrooms, that there may very well not be cameras in the courtroom, so we can't see what's happening as the case unfolds. And, of course, as you know, the defense has withdrawn the demand for speedy trial. This case is on hold for indefinitely. As the question looms, is Brian Koberger actually an incel, an involuntary celibate leading to intense hatred of women? I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here at Fox Nation and Sirius XM 111. Take a listen to Christy and Steve Gonsalves on 48 Hours. The bed was up against the wall. The headboard was touching the wall and the left side of the bed was touching the wall. And we believe that Maddie was on the outside and Kaylee was on the inside. According to Coroner Mabbitt, the killer's first victim was Maddie, says Steve. And then from Maddie, he moved on to your daughter. You believe she had awakened at that point? Yes. Yeah, there's evidence to show that she awakened and tried to get out of that situation. The way the bed was set up is what she was trapped. I didn't mean to already interrupt it, but I was going to show you just so you guys know, I don't know what is going on with this website. So I can't like move around it like we normally can, but this is how the bed is set up. Like the bedroom is set up. Um, the door, if you're looking right now, it's off to the left of the screen. And so in the bed would have been Kaylee towards the wall and then Maddie on the end at, or edge of the bed, you know, on the outside of the bed. I just wanted to give you guys that visual so you had a little bit of a visual to go with um, what was going on in the podcast or in the video. So 
Let me get it back over here now for you guys. He was trapped. Oh, my stars, when I'm hearing this, I'm just imagining based on what the Gonsalveses are saying, and they are privy to information to which we don't have access. They believe their daughter was trapped, that Koberger did not anticipate Maddie Mogan having anyone else in the room. Is that what they're saying with me? An all-star panel to make sense of what we are learning uh, first of all, to Rachel Schilke, breaking news reporter for the Washington Examiner. Rachel, thank you for being with us. What is he saying? What is Mr. Gonsalves saying? Well, he's thinking that there is evidence that maybe his daughter's best friend was the target and that his daughter just was an unfortunate victim of a horrible crime and that it's possible that he only wanted to kill one person. And just the way events unfolded, he ended up killing four. I'm not sure that I, I could buy into his theory that one of the girls was the intended victim. And that finding two girls in one room made him think he had to kill the other person, which would have been Kelly. But then why go on to other rooms and kill more people? Uh, with me, as I said, an all-star panel right now to Professor of Forensics, Jacksonville State University, author of Blood Beneath My Feet on Amazon, and star of a hit series, Body Bags with Joe Scott Morgan. Joe Scott Morgan joining us. Joe Scott, explain to me the significance of the furniture possibly being moved, one bed pushed away, the bed was set up, uh, according to Mr. Gonsalves, trapping his daughter. Yeah, the bed is essentially cornered, if you will. So you've got one, if you imagine the right, if you're laying on the bed and you're right over your right shoulder, that corner of the bed would be pressed against the wall. So okay, wait, 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 create, wait. Say that again very slowly so we can all envision. Yeah, sure, sure, no problem. So if you're laying in your own bed at home, mm -hmm. just imagine you're laying in your bed. And if you imagine over your right shoulder, the head of the bed is cornered in the right corner of the room okay okay that in, that what what happens is that increase that that creates a barrier where you have a wall immediate to your right then you'll have the wall behind your head so there's only two ways to actually escape out of that bed either you go over the foot of the bed which i believe is adjacent to the doorway or or you go off of the left side of the bed and if there is, unfortunately, in this case, what they are saying, at least allegedly, is that you have one victim that is deceased to the left or the outer aspect of the bed. Uh, and if you have some savage that is on top of you in this environment, he's pressing you down. He may be leaning over the body of an individual that's already deceased and he's attacking you. There's nowhere to go, Nancy. Uh, these are they're, they're not big, robust, muscular women. These are, you know, kind of diminutive ladies that are in this bed. Uh, the attacker is probably rather large uh, and he's wielding a knife. And just imagine the thing that's always come to mind with me with this knife attack is almost like a classic sewing machine where the needle goes up and down, up and down. And this, this is what you have, where you have this attack that's going on simultaneously between the two individuals. You're going to have somebody, in this particular case, we're referring to, who we're referring to as Kaylee, she's going to have an awareness that she's being attacked, Nancy. Her pain centers are firing. She's trying to get away. Maybe, and this is only a maybe, she has this awareness. The evidence is, is perhaps that she's raising her arms up to try to get away to fend him off. And I would imagine she has some pretty ghastly defensive injuries. I want to hear that sound again, if you don't mind, Jackie. This is Mr. and Mrs. Gonsalves. This is, of course, Kelly Gonsalves' parents speaking to 48 Hours. And I want to take in everything they're saying. Listen. The bed was up against the wall. The headboard was touching the wall, and the left side of the bed was touching the wall and we believe that Maddie was on the outside and Kaylee was on the inside. According to Coroner Mabbitt, the killer's first victim was Maddie, says Steve. And then from Maddie, he moved on to your daughter, 
you believe she had awakened at that point? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, there's evidence to show that she awakened and tried to get out of that situation. The way the bed was set up is what... She was trapped. She was trapped. Maddie is being identified by Coroner Mabbitt as the first victim. When there are multiple stabbings of multiple victims, it's very hard to determine based on the injuries yes. to the bodies alone who's the first victim chronologically. With me, Cheryl McCollum joining us, uh, founder and director of the Cold Case Research Institute. You can find her at coldcasecrimes.org, forensic expert and host of a new hit series, Zone 7 Podcast. Cheryl, there are extrinsic ways, not just the injuries to the body, not just those injuries themselves, to determine, it's commonsensical, who was the first victim. Explain. Well, number one, it was her bedroom that he entered first. Number two... That's assuming he knew and had identified who would be his first victim and knew which one was their bedroom. Correct. But again, when you've got somebody that enters on the second floor and goes to the third floor first, that was his target. He went where he wanted to go first for a reason. That's the order he chose. The other thing is she's probably not going to have any defensive wounds because she was asleep. Whereas, you know, Kaylee would probably have some because she did wake up, but there's another factor, not just the wall where the bed was up against the wall, but keep in mind, she was under covers. So if he put his knees on that bed at all, those covers also helped track her. So there would be injuries to the sheets, to the comforter, to her, you know, pajamas in some way. So those are the kind of things we're looking for that he enters the home on the second floor, goes up the stairs. There's no reason if he's just entering that house to kill people that he would go up those stairs. That to me is for a target. He enters her room first. That's the target. Okay, so, to you, Joe Scott Morgan, uh, I agree with everything Cheryl McCollum has just said. Um, the medical examiner and the coroner has stated that Clear, he, to him, it's clear Maddie was the first victim. I'm thinking, in addition to what Cheryl said, that we see other clues, such as, let's, let's hypothesize, if Maddie yep. was the first victim, that would make Kelly Gonzalez the second victim. They were in the same bed together. Um, their DNA could be on the knife as it stabbed the other victims. So that would indicate they were stabbed first. Their, their DNA on that knife would absolutely be transferred to victims three and four. Uh, and, yeah, and, and of that's, course, that's, that's Zana yeah, Kurnodal and Ethan Chapin. Wait, I had another right. thought I wanted to run by you. Yes, ma'am. Um, of course, the other two victims could very well still be asleep. They may not have heard the first two victims be killed. There may not have been any crying or screaming because it was at night. Everybody was sleepy in bed. But thinking of the order of the victims also, where was the knife found, Joe Scott, under which victim? Well, the sheath, sheath was found, at, yes. at, I think, uh, adjacent to Maddie's leg in the bed. So that would put the sheath itself at the foot of the bed when and it was I, first this, unsheathed maybe yeah and that you know that that's my big contention here nancy i, I bought one of these knives just fyi it, one of these k bar usmc mm -hmm. combat knives i bought it i just i wanted to feel what it felt like to see what the ability would or what the potential might be and you know everybody goes on and on about the snap and about the dna and what was really fascinating to me nancy was the fact that this thing's got a gigantic belt loop on it and i'm thinking why in the heck are you holding a knife sheath why is it if you're being so very careful first off did you forget your belt when you walked out of the house or are you wearing clothing perhaps that doesn't have belt loops like uh, i don't know a jumpsuit you know, like you could go buy at a big box store just to throw on all your clothing. Remember what we're hearing? We've heard dark clothing that has been repeated. But why would you 
just leave the knife sheath there on the bed. You've gone to all of this trouble, as Mac had mentioned, to creep up to that third story. You know, under the cover of darkness here, you've waited for the lights to go out. And then dramatically, you go to the end of the bed and, you know, unsheath this knife and then drop it and leave it behind. Why, why don't you have this thing fastened to you? Well, I wonder the, if when he sat point. down wearing the knife sheath, if he had it misplaced on his belt, it would have, you know, come forward. When you have a knife sheath on in the wrong, it's got to be in the right place on your belt. If you have it, for instance, right in front of you and you sit down, it's going to poke straight out. No, no, I, no, I don't no, know no, why no, he no, took no. no, it's it's not a clip. It's This is something this oh, is I like see. A, yes. metal, a leather loop that you run your belt through. This thing is robust. Nancy, this thing is made for combat. Marines are issued these things. There are a lot of, I have a lot of Marine buddies that still have theirs, that they were issued these. And these things are robust. They're meant to go into jungle environments. You're right. Why did he take off the knife sheath? Uh, And it is knife sheath, not the knife itself. I was thinking knife earlier. It's the knife sheath left behind with Koberger's DNA on the snap. Take a listen to more of what Mr. and Mrs. Gonsalves have to say to 48 Hours. He had to know when people were coming, people were going. I think that he at least had opened that door went in, tested the waters, looked around. Steve says the coroner told him the killer's rampage started on the third floor where both Maddie and Kaylee had their bedrooms. Christy thinks he wasn't expecting to find the two friends together in the same bed. I do think that his plan went awry. I do think that, you know, he intended to kill one and killed four. Let's think about that. Rachel Rachel Schilke joining me from the Washington Examiner isn't it correct that Kelly Gonsalves already had a job and she had come back that weekend to show her former roommates her new car? Yes, that's true. I remember that was one of the things that shocked me and saddened me about this case is that she wasn't even supposed to be there. I think her name was still on the lease. I think those details are a little fishy, but her name was still there so she could come and come and go from the house if she pleased, but she was already gone. You know, she had things going on. She just came back to see her best friend and never got to leave, which is so incredibly sad. Yes, well put, Rachel Schilke. I want to hear that one more time, what the Gonsalveses are saying about the order of the murders. Does it matter? Yes, actually, it does. When this finally goes to trial, listen. He had to know when people were coming, people were going. I think that he at least had opened that door, went in, tested the waters, looked around. Steve says the coroner told him the killer's rampage started on the third floor where both Maddie and Kaylee had their bedrooms. Christy thinks he wasn't expecting to find the two friends together in the same bed. I do think that his plan went awry. I do think that, you know, he intended to kill one and killed four. Okay, does that make sense? Part of that I agree with. But why would you go on to kill two more people that had not been alerted to your presence. Tara Malik is joining us, attorney, co-owner of Smith and Malik, former state and federal prosecutor at smithmalik.com. Tara, thank you for being with us. What would be the rationale of killing two other people that were not alerted to your presence? Well, we we simply just don't know enough yet. I mean, they may have been alerted to the presence. He may have gone on some sort of killing spree. You know, he's got these two people that are in his clutches. He may have gotten some sort of weird adrenaline rush or, you know, high off of taking these two lives and moved on to other people in the house. I mean, if, if you're, um, a killer who's going into a house and perhaps you're caught off guard by the fact that, there's more than one person. You may have had one person as a target in mind. You may start panicking and being worried about the fact that you're going to have witnesses, other witnesses who may be present in this house that you weren't expecting. And maybe your intent is to get rid of those and really um, try and get away from the situation without leaving a trace. And if um, Koberger is uh, and was the killer, and if he's the type of person who, you know, was obsessed with Uh, evidence and committing the perfect type of crime, that may have been a thought that was running through his head. Let me ask you this. Uh, Guys, uh, Tara Malik is a veteran trial lawyer. 
Does it make a difference? And I believe it does. And I've got a reason for saying that, that you are able to tell a jury the chronological order. Yeah, I think it does make a difference. I mean, when you're presenting a case to a jury, they even though one of the elements isn't the chronological order of what occurred, the jury, the jury is going to want you to paint a picture for them of what occurred when and where. They're going to want those types of answers. This presentation of evidence has to make sense to this jury. You're trying to convince them beyond a reasonable doubt that this person has committed the crime here. And so you're going to have to track this person's movement throughout this house. You're going to have to track the evidence throughout this house and paint that picture for them, as gruesome as it may be here. So for all of those reasons, I think it's very um, essential for this jury to understand, whatever jury is picked for this trial, to understand what occurred and exactly what order it occurred in. Um, And when when you're tracing kind of the forensic evidence and details of it, you know, you've got you've got a witness, um, a roommate who was not killed, and they're going to be part of the story as well. And they're going to be presenting what they saw purportedly in this house, too. So when you're explaining this to a jury, you have to have your story down. And it has to coincide with the physical evidence or the defense will tear it up when they get the witness on cross-examination, witnesses on cross-examination. Dr. Carla Manley joining us, clinical psychologist and author of Date Smart at drcarlamanley.com. Dr. Carla, um, many people believe that there's a certain order and a certain method that Koberger had to the murders. Weigh in. Absolutely. And it makes sense when you look at someone like Mr. Koberger, who has incel tendencies, where there is an underlying misogyny. And one would imagine, this is the part that gets my stomach when I think about this individual, that calculating, cold, merciless element that's obvious present, where there are strong, not diagnosing him, but strong, clearly strong antisocial tendencies, we can see that moving from the intended victim and then another and then another, that is part of that mindset, that pervasive mindset that arises from him wanting to have control of some sort over his environment. And if indeed he is an incel, feeling rejected feeling unwanted, and that rage that can come with that incel personality type, it is actually terrifying and so unfortunate for these young women. The disturbing theory of the existence of a, quote, kill kit, kill kit has reared its ugly head. Take a listen to our cut, 554, the Gonsalveses again. He was there to kill. He came in with a kit. I believe he had a kill kit. And you believe that everything right down to the implement of destruction, this large marine knife, that was all planned? All planned. It's inhumane. You wouldn't do these type of things to any living creature, let alone an innocent human being. We've heard of kill kits before. Take a listen to our cut 17B from ABC. We're talking about a prolific serial killer, Israel Keys, who had kill kits hidden all over the country. And he told agents something they'd never heard before, that he left kill kits or caches buried in several states filled with everything he'd need to commit a murder. They were in waterproof containers or five-gallon buckets and included guns and different things he could use to dispose of bodies. His strategy to grab people in remote locations like parks, campgrounds, even cemeteries. You might not get exactly what you're, there's not much to choose from in a manner of speaking, but there's also no witnesses really, there's nobody else around. Not just Israel Keys, not potentially just Brian Koberger that has kill kits. I'm sure you all have heard of BTK, Bind, Torture, Kill, Dennis Rader, the dog catcher killer who's responsible for so many murders. And we're still attributing murders to him. Take a listen to our cut 49B. This is his daughter speaking to Fox. 
he had hit kits. And so we're seeing with um, Rex Huerman, um, like handcuffs. My father had like um, fanny, back, fanny packs with like handcuffs and rope, ties, like bondage gear, bandanas. In hindsight, I actually did see my father's hit kit um, from the 85 murder down the street. It was a bowling bag. Um, it was like he didn't bowl. And so that was weird in hindsight. But at the time, my dad just had a lot of weird oddity bags around. To Cheryl McCollum, Cole Case uh, Investigative Research Director, Cheryl, what is a kill kit? It's a kit where the person is prepared to do what he thinks needs to be done in a murder scene. It's going to have a weapon. It may have something to bind or hold the victim in place. It's going to have maybe a tarp, a shovel, anything they want from A to B to commit this crime. There's no question that Koberger came kill ready. He had a mask, a hat, dark clothing, a knife, and a sheath. When they served the search warrant on his parents' house, he had knives and a Glock and, a, again, this black face mask and black gloves. He had these things. So he absolutely planned this and executed it with this kill kit. What about it, Joe Scott? A kill kit. We've seen it. We've heard of it. What would Koberger have had in such a kill kit if it did exist? If it did exist, my thought, and, and this is this is the big thing because people keep talking about DNA and all these sorts of things. Uh, I, what I would be very interested in, Nancy, is were there any kind of barriers, like clothing barriers, he would have had in there to change, to change with something to put distance, like garbage bags, for instance. If you're trying to do a quick change, because I can tell. You absolutely the stuff of nightmares what was perpetrated within that environment and it has been alluded to is an absolute and total bloodbath there is no way and i mean no way under god's green earth that someone could have exited that dwelling without having been just effuse with blood period end of story they would have had it all over them because you can't be in this close a contact with living victims where they are fighting against you, you're stabbing them repeatedly over and over and over again, and then you're going to walk through the house down into that next landing area and repeat this again. Because those injuries on Zana and Ethan have reportedly been as equally as savage. So it, I'm not going to say it's like taking a bucket of paint and dumping it on yourself, but you're going to have blood on you. What's happened to all that blood and what happened to everything that was on him? Did he have the ability right. to change clothes just outside the house? The idea of a kill kit is absolutely going to go to any type of premeditation. Of course, simply walking into the home with the knife sheath shows premeditation. Premeditation, of course, can be formed in the twinkling of an eye, just like that. It is not some long drawn out plan, but apparently here there was a long drawn out plan. Premeditation, uh, Tara Malik, high profile lawyer joining out of this jurisdiction is really key here. Agree or disagree? Absolutely agree. Absolutely. I mean, it, it goes to um, so many things. But again, you know, this prosecution team is going to have to pick a picture for this jury. And remember, the death penalty is on the table here. The prosecution has indicated that they are going to be seeking the death penalty. So they're going to have to be showing that this was a, you know, this was a crime that um, was really over and beyond what we would even consider, yes. quote unquote, normal into uh, the realm of absolutely heinous. And to go in and take the lives of four of them is bad enough. But to go in uh, with this idea that you're going to take multiple lives, to have a plan in place, to have this intent really does catapult it into a different category of crime as well. You heard uh, Dr. Carla Manley earlier refer to Brian Koberger as an incel, an involuntary celibate. Now, we've heard that many, many times, that phrase, that phraseology. I guess the single most well-known or notorious incel would be Elliot Rogers, the so-called virgin killer. Take a listen to our cut. 3B. On the day of retribution, I am going to enter 
the hottest sorority house of UCSD. And I will slaughter every single spoiled, stuck-up, blonde slut I see inside there. All those girls that I've desired so much, they would have all rejected me and looked down upon me as an inferior man if I ever made a sexual advance towards them. While they throw themselves at these obnoxious groups, I'll take great pleasure in slaughtering all of you. You will finally see that I am, in truth, the superior one, the true alpha male. <laughs> Yes. After I've annihilated every single girl in the sorority house, I'll take to the streets of Isla Vista and slay every single person I see there. Dr. Carla Manley joining us, clinical psychologist and author of Date Smart, Transform Your Relationships, Love Fearlessly. Dr. Carla, what is an incel? An incel is a male who is involuntarily celibate. And that's the key piece. It's the involuntary aspect that can make an incel so angry and violent and filled with rage. And in fact, we sometimes talk about incel rage and there are individuals who are incels who even claim that them being denied their sexual wants is a reverse rape. And that is how distorted their thinking can become because again of the feelings of rejection and not getting what they want. And that pursuit of being the alpha male, that man in their dreams who has every woman and has all of the sorority girls or whatever it is in their mindset that they deserve, they can act out in such heinous ways because they feel deprived and unjustifiably so in their mind. To you, Cheryl McCollum, what evidence, if any, is there that Koberger is in fact an involuntary celibate and incel? Well, I think some of the friends that have come forward to saying that, you know, he was rejected by women. He would go to bars and stare at women and make inappropriate comments that even one of the managers at a local bar had to tell him, hey, if you are going to say weird, creepy stuff to women, we don't want you back in here. And Koberger, you know, tried to say, hey, you've got the wrong guy, but then never came back to that bar. Some people have claimed that he has reached out over social media and, you know, hit people up on their DMs and never got responses. So there is some evidence that he has not had a steady girlfriend ever. No woman has ever come forward saying that she was a former girlfriend or a current girlfriend. So there's evidence that he, you know, not yes. by his own doing was alone. To Rachel, Rachel Schilke joining us from the Washington Examiner, or agree or disagree regarding evidence that Koberger is in fact an incel and voluntary celibate. I mean, I think there's evidence to point towards it and just, kind of what everybody has been saying, that like his methods of behavior and just the, the interviews that people have given to multiple outlets who have voluntarily come, voluntarily come forward and given this information, that is that's quite a heavy label to give somebody if you don't have the evidence to back well, it up. Yeah, you're right, Rachel so. Schilke. You're absolutely right. There is evidence that he was removed from one particular assignment and put in another where there were fewer or no women. There is evidence from people that worked with him when he was a teaching assistant that he was very dismissive and very rude, very strict on female students. And there were actually complaints. There is also claims that he would stalk or harass women at bars. Um, it just goes on and on and on, but you both referred to statements from 
friends going all the way back to middle school. Take a listen to this from our Fox Nation special on Brian Koberger. Who is he? I am blank is the title. After graduating community college, Koberger moves on to DeSales University, reconnecting with his childhood friend. To me personally, he really opened up more in his later college years. We we're talking more than we talked in high school. He called me fairly often. Bella shares private messages from around this time. One of the main topics of discussion, women. So the thing we talk about a lot, the dating scene, uh, it just got kind of just really hard. But it was, he was just having a time, you know, uh, getting ghosted a lot, um, you know, talking to a girl and then not, and then wondering, oh, why didn't she text back ever? And then also be like, yeah, I, I was talking to this girl and one of this girl was cute. And, I thought we hit it off and we didn't, I guess. So you would vent about stuff like that to me. I think you just felt frustrated is just the, the biggest word. Frustrated, a feeling Dr. Chris Mahandi believes is common for incels. Guys, um, the theory that Brian Koberger is an incel partially originates from the fact that according to multiple sources, Koberger tried to reach his victims on social media and was apparently rejected. Take a listen to our cut 562 from Crime Online. Just two weeks before four University of Idaho students were murdered last November, Brian Koberger sent a series of messages to one of the victims on Instagram. An investigator close to the case tells people in late October, an account authorities believe belonged to Brian Koberger sent a greeting to one of the female victims. And when he didn't get a reply, he sent several more messages to her. The source said he slid into one of the girl's DMs several times, but she didn't respond. Basically, it was just him saying, hey, how are you? But he did it again and again and again and never got a reply. On top of all of this happened, we are now learning that the judge is trying to close the courtroom to Rachel Schilke. Is this true? We know that the trial is not going forward October 2. We knew that as soon as the speedy trial demand was withdrawn. But do you believe that cameras will be banned from the courtroom as well? I think it's heading that way. Uh, I was listening to the debate um, at the court hearing recently, and the judge is bringing up a lot of different speculations from the media and kind of saying that the media is perpetuating misinformation, disinformation, and so having cameras might not be helpful to the jury or to the case at all. You know, I think that there's some truth to that, but also I think that people have a right to see what's going on because yes. this is a case that hits everybody. So We wait as justice unfolds. Goodbye. Goodbye, friend, she says. So I just put in the chat. I'll put the link again. So if you guys um, want to check out the chat, I'm going to put this link in the chat right now. <clears throat> it's actually to, if you guys want to watch that, Nancy Grace, I Am Blank, the Brian Kohlberger, um, like the the documentary that she just inserted. She did a little advertisement for herself. Um, if you guys want to watch that documentary, it is there in the chat for you guys. So you guys don't have to get the Fox Nation app and do all of that stuff. We covered it on the channel. It was a really good documentary. They also just did one over like genealogy, DNA. We just covered that last week. So it was really good as well. So those are a couple little bit of a couple little, couple little bit. I'm tired today. There, there's a couple for you guys to watch if you wanted to. Do you think that he was Papa Rogers? I don't, that, no, that one, I don't know that. Either that person just really knew some details of a crime scene that they shouldn't have known or they were there. Like the knife sheath, that thing, that, that kind of blows my mind. I also, I kind of match Miss Nancy tonight. Blue, blue, we're matching, we're matching. I'm going to have to get her a scarf. I forgot to put her scarf on her. I think I have a black one I'm going to put on her. <laughs> so she'll look cute. But um, that's all I have for you guys. I do have a pod, a couple podcasts that I want to play for you guys over um, Brian Kohlberger. Um, so I'm going to um, play those like one on one of our lives coming up. I know that there is um, some Charlotte Cena. There's like some updates in that case. So if you guys are still interested, we'll cover that, of course. And we can um, do that like on tomorrow's live or whenever. Um, and let me see. What else do we have? I think that's all we really have. I don't have a, my... 
search bar isn't full of windows right now, but I do have a few things for you guys. Um, but if you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do so. We are here nightly, 8.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is usually our time. We may go to 7.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're just, we're not there yet, but we might get there because the sun's going down earlier. We'll see how it goes. Thank you. Be happy for the super sticker. That's so incredibly nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love those puppies on your little picture. They're, they look really adorable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love Nancy. I know she even has the lights on her. <clears throat> the, the light is like perfectly on her tonight. She needs her own light. I'm covering her up too. She's like, don't put me in the corner. No one puts Nancy in the corner. Except for me. I wonder if she, we got our apartment renovated and I'm wondering if she scared one of the guys. Because it was, it was a group of the like, men that like, they don't talk to us. So we don't know who they are. They're just like a group of guys. They come in and they, you know, just did the work and then they left. But I had her like over in that corner. And if you go this way around, that's my, like, there's a bathroom there and a closet. So I'm wondering if one of them guys went to go do the closet or the bathroom, if she scared them. Cause I bet you she did. She scares you. She cries and have consequences to see. So yeah. So she does. She scares people. She scared me one night on the live. She scared the she scared the sh out of me one night on this live. I put her behind me and I got busy back. And, oh, it was someone had a question in the chat and I saw it and I was like, oh, I got to answer that question. So I start typing really fast, not thinking anything of it. And I'm blind on this side. I just wasn't thinking anything. I wasn't, I just forgot I moved her too. So I stood up and as soon as I turned around, I screamed, like I screamed to the point where I had to stop the live because we were, I was laughing so hard. I was like, there was a video playing and you guys didn't even, like no one even knew, but I was like, she scared the crap out of me. Like it was, she was, oh, it was bad. She is levitating a little. She kind of looks like she is. I'm going to get a little um, like head of her, like just to hold her, like carry around. So when I go to crime con next year, I can just run around with that thing and find her. Be like, where's Nancy? By the time Crime Colin comes next year, Nancy's going to be like, whoever that girl is, Tanya, Titanium Bill, make sure she's not around me. <laughs> Just kidding. I hope she doesn't do that. That'd be funny if she did, though. But thank you guys so much for coming tonight. I feel like my throat is getting a little sore. I don't know if it's just from the dentist or if, like, I hope I'm not getting, like, a cold or anything. Knock on wood. I have not been sick in years. I got my flu shot. I'm ready to party, you know? But thank you guys so much for being here tonight. I'll be on tomorrow at 8.15 p.m. Um, Actually, I may be on a little bit earlier because it's Sunday. Normally on Sundays, we'll do, sometimes we'll go a little earlier. Maybe we'll do a members live. We've got some new members to welcome in. So I'll see you guys all tomorrow. Have a good evening. Thank you guys so much for spending a little bit of your time with me. And I will see you guys on the next live. Bye, guys.